Hello, and welcome to Songs for the Struggling Artist, the blog cast. This is episode 326. My name is Emily Rainbow Davis, and it is Halloween. Happy Halloween! It's very probable that you are not listening to this on Halloween, unless you're one of those people who just like, is like, the podcast is here, and you just listen to it immediately. And if you are that person, thank you very much. That's very awesome. And to you especially, I say happy Halloween. But to those of you who are listening to this, you know, a few days after, or next week, or next month, I still say happy Halloween, because it's always Halloween in our hearts, is it not? <laughs> I don't know. I, I wasn't always a, a huge Halloween person, but some, something, something turned at some point. And now I just enjoy the heck out of it. What a delightful holiday. Uh, so today's blog is part two of the dragon reading book extravaganza. If you haven't listened to part one, I, I think this will s- still make a little sense. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, basically, what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm reading When Women Were Dragons by Kelly Barnhill, and I'm writing about it as I go. So uh, I've already done that for, the, for a previous blog, which got us through, I don't know, maybe a half of the book or something like that. A quarter, two thirds, who knows? Anyway, a chunk, a chunk of the book. Um, and now this is more. And I would say this one has more spoiler type things because I'm further into the book. If you care about spoilers and you think you're going to read this book and you don't want to know stuff that happens, then uh, skip this one and listen to it after you've read the book. How about that? Um, and if you want to know what the heck I'm talking about, uh, from last time, just go back and listen to part one. And you can also listen to my explanation of why I'm doing all of this, which um, is a post called, Is This a Dragon Zeitgeist? So any of those will be preparation for this one. I think you can just listen to this one anyway and enjoy yourself. But if you want more context, those are the two places to go. You can also just read them on the blog if you'd like. Uh, So, let me read it to you. This is In Which I Read That Dragon Book, Part 2. September 4th. I can really feel how Barnhill is a children's book writer. I'm actually surprised this book is being sold as one for adults. The narrator is a child looking at this event from a child's eyes. Sure. There's some violence and a lot of child abandonment. But have you read work for children lately? Some of it is quite dark. I mean, listen, maybe she really means to be writing for adults and just can't help making work that feels like it's for children. That happens to me all the time, so I'm sympathetic. I make some piece that I feel very clear is not for children, and then someone comes to see it and says, this would be great for kids. But I do wonder why an award-winning children's book author wasn't sold in the market she has already succeeded in. I also feel like I'd have a lot more grace for this book if it were a children's book. Or YA. YA is full of dangerous stuff these days. Why isn't this a YA book? Anyway, I read more than I meant to last night, mostly because I was hoping for something to pop out at me that I might tell you about here in this accounting. My feeling that this is really a children's book is all I have, I guess. September 5th. The kid in the book is now 13 and has lost her friend due to a homophobic panic from her father. It would appear that he has also evicted his daughter's friend's grandparents. This father better get eaten or immolated by the end of this book, is all I gotta say. So far, the only satisfying dragon moment was in a brief list of dragon activity, where some dragons seem to have eaten some asshole strike breakers. This section of the book was not particularly compelling, but it did make me very nervous about my own work. I also have quite a bit of after-the-fact reporting of dragon events, I worry that my own work could feel as dry and perfunctory as the list of dragon-related incidents in this book did to me. 
I hope these sorts of moments in my work are full of the person who was reporting them so that it's not just the report, but the human need to share things that have happened to them. I think I've done that, but no one can ever be too sure. (laughs) So for a moment, that chapter felt like a cautionary tale. If my library app is accurate, and I concede that it hardly ever is, then I'm not yet halfway through this book, though I am on chapter 19. September 6th. So it turns out the girl's mother hadn't turned dragon for the two months she was away. She just had regular old cancer, which then kills her when the protagonist is 15. Then the father turns out to be an even bigger piece of shit than he was before, and he was a giant piece of shit before, by moving the kids to an apartment to live on their own while he moves his pregnant mistress into their house. Maybe this is why this is not a children's book? I don't know. I know it's the 50s, but could a father really get away with abandoning his kids like that then? The dragons, I can accept. Children living like kept mistresses on their own in a shitty apartment stretches the bounds of credulity somehow. Oh, I sure hope someone gets eaten soon. September 7th. Okay, finally, we get someone who is a dragon who wants to do dragony things. And it is a child. I suppose one of the things I'm finding frustrating about this book is that the narrator is on the outside of a dragon experience and is judgmental of dragons and is learning about them through censored experiences. It's just frustrating. I want to go flying through the air with dragons. I don't want to experience the gaslighting around them. Just put me on a dragon's back or something already. The doctor's description of being on mic with one in the air as she transforms is not enough. September 8th. I suppose you have to make a guy a real big villain, so we're chomping at the bit to have him set on fire. But I've been rolling my eyes at how awful this father is. I suppose it's because he's awful in a cartoonish way. So, despite having shown some tenderness to his wife, he just seems like a cartoon bad guy. Set him on fire already, dragon child! I mean, I know it's the 50s, and he feels like a king, and doesn't see what he's doing, but I don't know. It's like, Brett Kavanaugh is an awful human. He's petulant and whiny, and he felt entitled not only to sexually assaulting women in his youth, but also to his position on the Supreme Court. And yet, he is a human man, not a cartoon villain. He has done terrible things, and if a dragon ate him, I wouldn't complain. But I also understand him. I grew up with boys like him. I know where he's coming from. I do not know where this kid's dad is coming from. It feels like the answer is the 50s. But that's not enough. It's really not that hard to make people want to have a dragon turn a person into toast. They're not real people. They don't have to be extra awful for us to feel like he's asking for it. I feel like I'd prefer the alternate world in this book. The world where the dragon ladies are flying around, having a fabulous time in the mountains or wherever. Instead, we're stuck in the world that was so terrible, they felt like they had to leave it. Take me to the dragons instead! September 9th. So far in this book, the only anger we ever see is almost entirely misplaced. We saw the mother slap her daughter when she was mad at uh, the dragons? Her husband? I don't remember, but her kid had nothing to do with it. Now we have the kid getting very mad at the librarian for talking about her aunt and dragons. But she's not really mad at the librarian deep down. Then she also gets mad at her kid sister cousin for no reason. I know people do this, but it is not very satisfying to read about. I just want to yell, you're all mad at the wrong people. 
Open your eyes and get it together. Call on the dragons already. I have little patience with this. September 10th. Things are kicking into gear with the dragon professor and the heroic librarian. Now, if you've listened to my audiobook for kids, you know that I am a particular fan of librarians, so I don't object to this librarian being amazing. I will say, though, that she seems to be a little bit too heroic. Like, she manages to do everything? She's the star witness of the HUAC committee, the benefactor and head of a whole library system, the leading sponsor of dragon research, and she has time to look after a little girl? I mean, I'm down with dragons existing, but superhuman librarians feels like a bridge too far. The kid now seems to be starting to accept the dragon reality, so I suspect I'm going to start liking this book a little bit more once she actually gets into dragons. It's like you choose a book about trains, and they spend the first half of the book denying the existence of trains while hinting at them, just out of view every so often. Just get to the trains already. That's what I'm here for. September 11th. One thing that is driving me absolutely bonkers about this book is the withholding of information. We have a protagonist who seems to want to know what is going on, and in her youth, she is presented with a trove of information and explanations. She has letters written to her, an explanatory pamphlet, and the correspondence of her aunt, who she was so curious about. And this girl puts this stuff in a secret place, doesn't read it, and promptly forgets about it. When she finally remembers it, many years later, she goes to get it, and once again does not read it. Maybe I just don't understand how a person could not read their own correspondence when it has been explicitly written to them and would provide answers I was seeking. Again, I find dragons easy to accept, but to introduce a plot device with a box full of answers and not open it? Come on. Just discover the box later or something. Why you gotta tell me about the documents in the secret compartment if you're just gonna leave them there? It's very frustrating. Like, I was so relieved when the protagonist finally remembered they were there and went to get them. But then she didn't read them again? And then later, when she sees her dragon aunt, her dad gives the kid a box for her from her mom. And guess what she doesn't do again? Good Lord, what is this child's problem? She can't open things? She can mother her cousin slash sister and take college courses in secondary school, but she can't open a goddamn letter or a goddamn box? Gee whiz. This book is due in two days, and I'm at 70%. I could knock it out. But maybe I should follow the protagonist's example and just not open it. September 12th. I am astonished by how this writer has taken the teeth out of dragons. She's given them handbags and knitting. She has them help out at church picnics. They seem to be just a bunch of nice Midwestern ladies who happen to have taken dragon form. Their main gesture is to put their hands slash paws to their hearts. Ugh. I would prefer to read about one of them tearing a man apart with her talons. But instead, I'm reading about a bunch of nice dragons chaperoning the high school prom. The protagonist's state seems like a real tool. Maybe they'll burn him up by the end of the night? A girl can dream. September 13th. The book was returned to the source, Queen's Public Library, last night. Digital copies just disappear, really. You can't just hold on to a copy and pay the fine later like you could with a physical copy. So I think I got to about 
75%. And there are now 34 people ahead of me in line for this book. It's so popular, my library bought two more copies. This is both good and bad news for me. Good, because if dragon content is becoming popular, if people like women turning into dragons, they might end up at my artistic door at some point. Bad, because it'll be months before I finish reading this book that makes me so mad. The thing is, I'm realizing maybe folks just aren't ready for a story where women have genuine power. I'm also reading Night Bitch right now, and there's such a strong prohibition to that protagonist feeling her own rage that she turns into a dog. In that form, she is able to indulge her fury and tear into meat the way she wants to. I have not heard anyone talking about this book, but I like it loads more than When Women Were Dragons, despite them sharing an annoying special interest in mothers. But still, all these stories are within the confines of continuing to live in the current messed up patriarchy. It's possible that a lot of people are not ready to imagine how that might turn around. Oh, well. I mean, I am. And so are a handful of people I know. Anyway, temporary conclusion until I move up 35 places in line. I do not think Barnhill stole my idea. Or if my work was somehow her source material, she completely missed the point. Knitting? Dragons? Church picnic? Dragons? Pah! Excuse me while I go set something on fire. So I posted this over a month ago, and you'd think maybe I would have gotten access to the book again by now, but you would be wrong, because it's still like seven weeks away from here, according to my app. So uh, so I still don't know how this book ends. Uh, I will write the thing when I, when I get there, um, but, it might, but it might be another couple months, maybe. Um, so yeah, who knows what happens at the end of this book? Maybe it all works out great. Wouldn't that be great? I would, I would love for it to end well. Um, I feel like that rarely happens though. If you're not like really jamming on something and then somehow it ends in a way that changes your mind. I don't, I, don't, I can't even think of an instance where that has happened. Um, yeah. So, um, I <laughs> I learned a, a Jane's Addiction song f- for this <laughs> because I was like, okay, I don't know. I, th- I have a couple of, of book-themed ones s- s- in the pipeline that I could pull out. Um, but initially I thought, you know, my I, got, I sort of got into this because I thought, oh, is this lady stealing from me? I Actually, I didn't think she was, but... Several people thought maybe that was the case and that I should investigate and blah, blah, blah. So I thought, oh, maybe I'll do a, a, a song about stealing. And then, of course, it, ha- it had to be Ben Caught Stealing by Jane's Addiction. And then I abandoned it because I thought, oh, no, that's not, that's not the right thing. Uh, but then I brought it back <laughs> because I realized... This particular post especially, I feel like the part where the dragons are just good. They're like too nice. They don't do anything wrong. They're just out trying to help their community. And I'm just longing for them to misbehave. You know what I mean? I feel like maybe that's another way that this author, like her children's book, Impulse is coming through this, like, desire to be a really good girl and no but no bad people, no bad things are going to happen except for the one bad dad and, you know, the culture as a whole, of course. But, like, the women can't behave badly, I guess is what I'm saying. The men behave very badly in this, in this book. And a couple of, like, handmaidens to the patriarchy don't behave great either. But 
Generally, the women are so well-behaved, even though they're fucking dragons. And it makes me so frustrated (laughs) because I feel like uh, uh, this is this is this is part of the way we're stuck here is that we think we're gonna like break open the patriarchy by being nice to it and it just doesn't work like that um so I thought this song is actually great because it's not a song I actually ever liked before but uh, but it's it's grown on me immensely and I, what I appreciate about it it is ha- it has no morals just none. The song is about the joy of thievery, the the joy of shoplifting. And you know what? It's bad to shoplift. Don't do it. Absolutely. But like this song does make it does not make a single apology. All it's just like it is great to steal. I enjoy stealing. It's as simple as that. That's like the thrust of the song. And and I I just wish any character could be like that in this book. So I'm going to play that for you in a minute on guitar, on acoustic guitar, because, you know, I was I have to subvert, do I not? Meanwhile, thank you so much for listening. If you like the blogcast, please tell someone about it. Share it, like it, subscribe, uh, do all those things that, that, that help a podcast. And uh, if you'd like to support it with your dollars, patreon.com slash Emily R. Davis. There's also Kofi, PayPal. All those links are in the show notes. I appreciate any and all support, and I thank you for your ears on this situation, most of all. So, here, I shall give to you Ben Caught Stealing by Jane's Addiction. Uh, And... um, I don't think there's anything else to say about it. It is a very, yeah, the song is is very clear. It is immoral, and I love it for that reason. Okay, here it is. I've been caught stealing once when I was five. I enjoy stealing. It's just as simple as that. When I want something, I don't want to pay for rent. Yeah.